to my beautiful friends. My baby girl. I think Nola's a freak. I'm not a freak. You're a sex addict. I'm not a sex addict. Excuse me, miss. Hey, boo. Baby girl. And I'm damn sure nobody's property. My name is Nola Darling. So the Artur, the writer, producer, director, Spike Lee is at it again in his latest TV series, She's Gotta Have It, which is on Netflix right now. So how did I feel about it? Well, let's get into it. My name is Brandon Keith Avery, and this is just my opinion. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in for my opinion slash review for She's Gotta Have It, a Netflix original. But before we get into the review, Help your boy out by clicking that subscribe button. Also, click the bell so you can be notified when I make uploads. And also, give me that thumbs up. Let's see if we can get this video to 100 likes. Now, I am a pretty big fan of Spike Lee. I pretty much love all of his content. Um, I've said before in other past videos that he is a very unconventional director. He is always putting out pieces of art that is completely different from any other filmmaker. And I really do appreciate that. Now, this is called She's Gotta Have It. If you did not know, it is based off the 1986 movie that was written and directed by Spike Lee as well, based on the same name. And um, I do recommend you go see that as well if you want to. It's only an hour and 24 minutes. It is on Netflix. And if you want my opinion slash review my take on that, I did shoot a video of that and upload it on my channel a few days ago. So there's a link to that down in the description box. But now... Um, you know, I, I really did like that film. It is predominantly shot in black and white, that uh, uh, old 86 version film. And the reason for that is because uh, Martin Scorsese, a big time director in Hollywood, taught Spike Lee uh, in New York and NYU. That's where they uh, that's where he graduated school from. And that was based on uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, film, The Raging Bull, which came out in 1980. And that film was predominantly shot in black and white and it had a few scenes of color. And so that's where Spike Lee got the idea in 1986. But now he's doing this Netflix series. And I'll just go ahead and say off the top that, you know, while I did like both series, I did enjoy the 2017 version better. That's pretty common. I mean, well, common sense uh, is pretty much a given. Why? Because, you know, Spike Lee had more resources. And also now, you know, this is 31 years later. And so he has much more experience, you know, in the film uh, making industry. So, I mean, I'll, I'll say it like this. The 2017 Netflix version version is what he wanted to do and the 86 version is what he could only do and i say that just based on like the budget because in the 86 version the budget was only one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars it was only his second piece of art that he put out so he really didn't have that much creative control and whatnot uh what, what's also fascinating and i mentioned this in the 86 version review is that you know there was no retakes in that whole 86 version and they shot the whole thing in 12 days I just said that the budget was one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for the 86 version. And I tried to research what the budget was for this Netflix version that came out in 2017. But sometimes they don't release that information um, and I couldn't find it. This Netflix series is uh, 10 episodes. This is the first season. And Spike Lee did write and direct all 10 episodes. And based on that, this is a first ever in Netflix. Like out of all the Netflix series, no director has actually uh, directed all episodes of a given season and spike lee is the first one to do that so you know spike lee i just want to give you a little applause on that for being the first you know i do kind of consider that you know somewhat of a big deal um but this is you know both versions is kind of described as like a comedy or dramedy or comedy or drama or you can just say for short like a, you know a dramedy and um what it's about is you have a character by the name of nola darling uh she's in her upper 20s um, you know, she's a, some, you can consider her a feminist. She's an artist. She's somewhat of a painter and she's just going through life in Brooklyn, New York, you know, just trying to do her thing, you know, not be labeled by what society, you know, would cast her as. And she's just kind of bouncing back and forth between three to four lovers, you know, three men. And if you want to add a fourth, you can say a woman too. Now, this, the first version came out in 86 and that was a big deal then because just pretty much there was no content in mainstream media that addressed that. I mean, of course, you know, it's always, well, society, not me, but society always says that it's okay for, you know, a man to sleep around 
around and have multiple partners, you know, but if a female does that, you know, she's called a number of names. And so Spike Lee did have a lot of testicular fortitude for making some content like that in 86. And now he's kind of doing it again, adding a lot more flavor in 2017. And I'm kind of late to the party with seeing this, um, with seeing this series. Um, some of the, you know, some of the critiques that people have been saying was like, okay, that was a big deal in 86, but that's really not a big deal in 2017. I don't really see what the big deal is. I don't even look at it like that. I just kind of look at it as just more content, you know, that's pretty much uh, entertaining. But uh, we have Nola Darling. She's been played by somebody named DeWanda Jones. That's just not popping up on my radar. I think she did a great job. Uh, some of her lovers are a character by the name of Mars Blackman, played by Anthony Ramos. Uh, Jamie Overstreet, uh, played by uh, Lyric Bent. Uh, someone named Greer Childs, played by Cleo Anthony. And Opal Gilstrap, played by Elphanish Hadera. They all did a great job. And what I, one of the things that I did appreciate in this series is, you know, Nola knows her pickings or whatever. She, you know, each lover that she has in this series and in the original movie are completely different. She kind of has like a family man over here, you know, uh, an exquisite model over here that travels the world and, you know, introduces her to exotic things and is very spontaneous and is really narcissistic. Then she, you know, these men are older than her, but then she always, she has a guy that's younger than her by the name of Mars that's like really into, you know, hip hop and younger than her and just kind of makes her laugh. So she's really good with her pickings. And, you know, if, in my opinion, if she can, you know, bunch all these people up into one person, I mean, you can argue that she can pretty much have, you know, the perfect mate. Um, but one thing that I want to mention is the character Mars Blackman played by uh, Anthony Ramos in the first episode. I really wasn't fond of his character initially because I just thought he was a poser. I thought he was faking it, you know, just trying to be down or whatever with all his hip hop swag and stuff like that. But about 10, 15 minutes in the episode, you know, my senses came to me. And I was like, okay, I don't know what I was thinking, Brandon. You know, he's being genuine. You know, he's being real or whatever. And I really did like his character. Uh, he was very funny. Um, you know, he had his own sense of style. And I like that. I like when people are doing their own thing. And uh, this character, Mars Blackman, played by uh, Anthony Ramos was doing you know just that to the t something else that's fascinating about this is in the uh 86 version uh, of this uh of this series of the movie in 86 spike lee was the character in his own movie playing mars blackman and mars is actually the name like when he was writing this series in 80 or this movie in 86 he could not come up with the name for Mars Blackman. So his grandmother gave him the name like, hey, won't you name him Mars? And just to let you know, Lil Spike, you know, she was talking to her grandson. Mars is the uh, Mars is the name of my grandfather. So Mars is actually the real life name of Spike Lee's great, great grandfather or whatever. And so I just think that's kind of neat or whatever that he used that. And he's kind of just paying some lineage, you know, to respect to his uh, ancestors and part of his family. And I just kind of think that's cool. But uh, for the most part, I really did enjoy this series one thing that just stood out to me is this is in brooklyn new york and the first thing that popped out to me is the amount of color in this whole series it's just bright with color from like i said nola is an artist she's a she's a black american african-american and so she's really passionate about expressing herself uh with the african diaspora and just african culture and so she'd be painting the hell out of these portraits or whatever putting them around the city and there's just so much color you know in these paintings and that's just really something that stood out to me there's so much color in her outfits and her clothes and her apartment and just the whole uh background of the whole series like the cinematographer did and spike lee did a great job with all the contrast in this uh, series these 10 episodes because there was just so much color it popped out at every scene and this is also something i noticed especially because the 86 movie was predominantly shot in black and white or whatever uh something else that i really did appreciate was the soundtrack the soundtrack was fire I mean, there was like not one song in this movie or in the I keep saying movie in this series that I did not appreciate. Uh, this series is broken into 10 episodes uh, and each episode is only around 30 to 35 minutes. So it's not that long. You can easily binge watch this um, in a weekend, of course, or even, a, you know, a weekday after work. You know, you can just kind of fly right through this. And, you know, what's easy is like you don't even have to sit through the credits anymore with Netflix. As soon as a uh, an episode is over, they have an option where you can just skip the credits and skip the intro and just fly right into uh, the next episode. So it flies by for you. But the soundtrack 
track was dope. I mean, they had some Frank Sinatra in there, had some rap, had some hip hop, had some jazz, had some R&B, you know, from, you know, recently of a past uh, few years to 50, 60 years ago. Just all these important gems and artists that, you know, with all these great tracks over the years in the past decades, you know, Spike Lee did a great job of picking those films out. And I and something else that I appreciate that I've really never seen anybody do before at the end of every song that, that popped up in an episode, he was able to show on the screen the album cover of set song or whatever. And that's just something that, you know, n not too many people do. And just kind of gives you an example of why and why I like about Spike Lee is he just kind of stands out from every other filmmaker. And so that's just on top of the color and the soundtrack. That's just something else um, that I did appreciate. And I said this is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Spike Lee has a way with the camera moving it around. Um, he had a lot of aerial shots, especially in the bedroom, because Nola's character, um, she does like to have a lot of sex. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to have sex, have sex or whatever. You know, make sure you use protection out there. But, you know, some of the sex scenes that he was using that he shot or whatever i really do like the area shots above her uh her bedroom and i will talk about the specifics when i get to nola's character uh later on because i'll just go ahead and give you um uh, something now there was a lot of things that i did like about nola's character um in this series and there was some things that really kind of turned me off but you know if you really was you know down for nola or whatever don't turn the video off now i'm going to explain all that later um the, the thing that another thing that stood out to me the most was the fourth wall breaking in this whole series where the what said actor they just stop what they're doing and they look at the camera and they talk to the audience or whatever and it's not that they're just talking to the audience this fourth wall breaking the every scene that they was doing this every actor it was like poetry or whatever it was so po poetic i can't even say that word it was so poetic anyway um, I, it was it was powerful and it had a strong impact or whatever. And I it just it spoke to me every time like, you know, they everyone was just really making a definitive statement about, you know, how they felt in the moment with their surroundings right there. And it just spoke volumes or whatever. So it's and no one else really does this or whatever. And that's just another reason why this series is so good. And just, you know, another reason why Spike Lee turn um, why Spike Lee stands out so much. And I have a lot of notes here. Uh, because I, I just wanted to, um, I got actually two pages or whatever, because I, I mean, I don't care. I didn't, I didn't want to leave, uh, anything out or whatever. Um, something else, um, uh, that this series talked about with all the characters is there's a lot of egos. There's a lot of pride. Uh, there's a lot of self-esteem issues as well. This uh, addresses a lot about women and what they grow through in society from just different walks of life, because everybody is a product of their environment or whatever. And that kind of shapes and molds us or whatever. And we for the most part, we did get to see why everybody thought the way they thought, why everybody walked the way they walked or whatever. You know, of course, women, uh, you know, they don't like to be called hoes and B words and skanks and things like that. And this series did touch on that or whatever. And no one should just ever disrespect a woman or whatever. But and this may piss some some people off. But at the same time, let me make sure I word this correctly and I phrase this correctly. But. I don't want to say that. Well, I'll just say men and women. There's not. I don't want to put everybody in a box and saying that a man should act this way and a woman should act this way. No, I'm not saying that. But there are some there is a lot of character growth, you know, between the characters in this series to where if they did change their behavior, maybe they would not be treated a certain way or whatnot. And I'll give you an example, and this may turn some women off or whatever, but there was a character in this movie that was wearing a very sexy dress, a very provocative dress. And I think this was like in episode four. And she was doing it because she wanted to feel good about herself. She knew it was sexy. She knew it was going to draw attention. She knew it was going to turn heads. But at the same time, there was a male in this um, in this series that was like, hey, if you don't want attention, you maybe shouldn't dress like that. And that kind of pissed that character off or whatever. And they may piss you off too, like males shouldn't think like that. But at the same time, you had women in the series that was giving Nola that same advice that was older, that was elders or whatever. So, I mean, you have men and women saying that. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. If I put on a fireman outfit or whatever and I go walk out in public, people are going to think I'm a fireman. If I wear a police uniform and I go walk around in public, people are going to think I'm a policeman. If I have on a white coat, people are going to think I'm a doctor. 
character. If I have a short dress on and I'm shaking my ass and got my titties and, you know, sh bouncing back and forth like that or whatever, you know, it's going to turn some heads. It's going to draw attention. So, I mean, you can't necessarily get me. I'm not saying that a man just has a, the right to disrespect you or even a woman has the right to disrespect you. You know, if you're dressing like that. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But at the same time, you can't get mad at the attention that you may receive based on that decision that you made. And that is just one of the arcs that one of the characters had to go through, you know, in this series that kind of had to deal with their growth. Um, this also has like and, and with the fourth wall breaking, it's not just Nola that's doing the fourth wall breaking. It's all the characters as well. You know, giving like Nola's giving her side of the story and her perspective of how she's dealing with all her lovers. But we also get the perspective of all her lovers as well. All three men and the woman as well. But what I also like that, of course, you know, we're going to get more content opposed to the 86 version because this is 10 episodes and that 86 version was only an hour and 24 minutes. We also get to see some backstory from the lovers, too. We get to see where Mars hangs out with his friends and when he's not with Nola. We get to see where Jamie is hanging out when he's He's not with Nola as well, whether he has a family or not, children, you know, a wife that he may or may not be separated to or divorced from and going to school and things like that. We necessarily don't get to see um, any other aspects of uh, Greer's life, the model that's super duper narcissistic, but we don't necessarily have to. Spike Lee was, you know, did a good job of balancing all that to, to knowing what uh, the audience members like myself will want to know um, as far as the character's best story besides Nola or whatever. And that just has to go with the writing and, you know, the editing and his directing and just, you know, knowing what we want to see or at least what I want to see, what I appreciate and knowing what, you know, can be left on the cutting room floor. Uh, something else that I do want to address in the um, in the black community um, if you're not black, please don't get offended by this. I'm just going to be honest with you. But when it comes to therapy and not necessarily today, I mean, I grew up hearing this a lot of times, but as far as black people going to therapy, it's always discussing like the black or African-American people like, oh, I ain't going to therapy. I ain't going to that. That's like white people shit or whatever, you know, and that's just something that people will say. We don't mean that in a derogatory sense. We're just saying that. But a lot of black people. Uh, let me just uh, let me just speak for myself. I don't want to speak for all black people, but. Because I, I just can't do that because we are super duper vast. But, you know, I've always heard that, you know, black people really just don't like to go to therapy. They, they just don't feel like that's, you know, for them. And that can be extremely problematic and cause a lot of problems. And therapy is important. So one thing about NOLA, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, is actually, let me let me press pause there. The OK, let me. OK, yeah, yeah, we, we can all address this in one fell swoop so i'm gonna press pause there about the therapy i'm gonna come right back but i want to say something about nola's character for the most part i did love like nola's character um i will talk about something that i did not like that i had the same exact problem in the 86 version and i am disappointed that spike lee didn't fix it but for the most part i like nola because she's very honest she doesn't hold any punches she kind of for the most part She's she just tells what the deal is. She, she necessarily doesn't lie to her lover. She's not like a pimple player. She's very transparent. She's like, look, you know what it is. Uh, I, I see multiple people. If you like that, great. If you don't, you know, there's the door. OK, you can't get mad at that. If you decide to stay or whatever and you just want to get caught in your feelings because and, you know, when you thought this was just going to be like a booty call or friends with friendship type of relationship, that is on you. So I will give it to Nola for, you know, addressing that and not holding back any punches. Uh, but at the same time, Nola can be very annoying at times. She's very unstable and she can not know what she wants and just throw temper tantrums or whatever. Because a lot of times when she's asking for help and people try to help her, she just kind of she kind of uses and abuses them or whatever. And she gets this feedback from everybody or whatever, not just the men, but her parents, the men she's dating, the woman she's dating, you know, her co-workers and things like that. And so it's just like, you know, really annoying or whatever. She has all these rules. I'm like, yeah, you know what it is. You know, this is a booty call. Or we friends or we just got done smashing. It's time to go. But then like 20 minutes later or a few episodes later, she's like, why are you doing me like this? I thought you cared about me or whatever. I thought she was going to take care of me. You know, am I this? Am I that? I mean, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. You the one making all the rules and now you the one catching feelings. You know what the deal is. So just kind of like all that back and forth was just kind of annoying to me or whatever. And um, I didn't, you know, I didn't like that. But 
it was somewhat of a realistic character and you know this can't have a mary sue or whatever i mean people in real life do have problems and that's okay as long as you and people do make mistakes and that's okay as long as you're trying to fix those mistakes and address those problems and going back to the therapy i felt that she did do that because all the problems that she had she realized it early on in episode three or episode four and she tried to fix it hence she going to therapy so i respect the fact i'm not gonna knock anybody for not being perfect that's insane nobody's perfect Everybody has problems, like I just said, and mistakes. But I do like the fact that she tried to go to therapy and she tried to work it out. She tried to fix it, you know, and, you know, one person was like, hey, you need to go to therapy. And for first she was a little like turned off by, it, but, you know, she did or whatever. So, you know, I do respect her character uh, because of that or whatever. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of character growth with Nola. And from the beginning of the series, I did not know how this was going to end. And I really do like that because you don't want anything to be predictable. Um, you know, Fat Joe also popped in this. and I just want to say that this is his first TV appearance. So, you know, go Fat Joe. I've never really known him to be an actor and he did a pretty decent job. I did enjoy seeing him on screen. I, I did like that. And as far as if Nola's character did like uh, get all of her problems and, you know, things ironed out, you're just going to have to see the series for yourself. Um, I do. Uh, there is something else that I did not like. I did not. It was 10 episodes. I did not like episode 10. Um, I just thought it was just too much, too much of an ego trip, just kind of too unrealistic. Uh, Nola just kind of got, you know, big headed or whatever with what she tried to do. And in the real in the real life, I don't necessarily see how they can play out with anybody. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I'll just say Thanksgiving and there was a gathering and I'm just like, really? Okay. I can understand how that may happen in the beginning, but there was like a little singing and dancing, a little number and it was choreographed nice and all that. But I'm just like, really? Ain't, no, ain't nobody going to sit there and stand for that. This is silly. And I also just throw in a little uh, jab in there, the three headed, the three headed monster. I do not like the three headed monster. No, if you've seen the series, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, you will know what I'm talking about. And real quick, before I end this and before I get my rating, I just want to also list some uh, Easter eggs or whatever. Um, there were a lot of Easter eggs with Spike Lee and all of his films that he's directed over the years with Malcolm X, uh, Crooklyn. Um, I was going to say um he's got game now he's got game malcolm x crooklyn and also do the right thing those are the only ne those are the only easter eggs from past films that i noticed if you notice any more please let me know in the comment section below also there is an act uh, uh spike lee's sister joy lee she played nola's mother uh in this series or whatever so you know that's kind of just cool how you know he's bringing in his family and also if you watch episode six there is a scene at a gallery and there is just a random woman that comes up and she just expresses how much she likes Nola's paintings. And Nola, at one point, Nola was like, hey, you look so familiar. And this is an Easter egg. That woman that pops up is actually the original Nola Darling in the 86 version. Um, and her name is uh, Tracy Camilla Johns or whatever. And I didn't catch it the first time when I, I was trying to do a little look up some information before I shot this review. And I saw and I was like, oh, snap. Was that really her? So I had to go back and I was like, man, that was her or whatever. So I didn't notice it the first time, but, you know, I, I just kind of liked that or whatever. And uh, y'all already talked about that. The main thing that grabbed me off is at the very first episode and at the very last episode of this series, episode one and episode 10, when Nola was breaking the fourth wall, addressing us with, you know, her poetic voice, she made a definitive statement just saying, you know, nobody's going to own me. I'm my own person. Uh, I'm nobody's property. No one is going to fit me into a box. And she's referring to her lovers. But no one ever tried to do that. Everybody tried to take their relationship with her past a booty call or past a friends with relationships, uh, a friends with benefits, excuse me, type of deal. Everybody wanted to, you know, just be, you know, with her and respect her and like, hey, I don't want to just have sex with you. I want to take you out. I want to be that man for you. I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do that. No one tried to own. No one tried to own her. Not the men, not the women. So I never really understood why she was making these definitive statements. The series never addressed that. They didn't address that in the 86 version and they didn't address that in this series. Now, there are some things that happened within the series in the middle of the series that kind of maybe led to her thinking that way and having that pattern of thought. 
But the series started out that way in episode one. And I'm just like, OK, are they going to go back and have some backstory of to why she feels this way? Because I also said that everyone is a product of the environment or whatever. But then the, the, the series or the movie, both of them never went back and so addressed it. Something happened to her when she was a little girl at school, anything like that. Somebody tried to grab her in the street one time and that pissed her off and made her go to therapy. But that happened later on. I mean, she had a great background. She had loving friends from all directions. She had both of her parents in her life. Or even if that's fine, you know, s still people have problems. That's okay. I'm not judging anybody. But the series never did address why she feels like she's being owned. And that is just something that kind of turned me off. But overall, guys, I really did enjoy the series. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, it was a really nice take on someone else's life in Brooklyn, New York. that had a lot of color, great soundtracks, great characters. Uh, it was a fun ride. It was an easy watch. And uh, also it had to deal with uh, there. It talked about gentrification. Um, it talked about race relations and racism and who people that think re reverse racism is a real thing, which is incredibly stupid. And even if reverse racism was real, it wouldn't be real if there wasn't racism in the first place. So let's fix the root of the problem before you try to get mad about somebody with reverse racism. And also this film also not film, but series also dealt a lot with um, like with mulattoes and mixed people of uh, black and white descent and them embracing themselves and accepting who they are and accepting how society would view them. And there's also some mixed people in the, and I think mixed people are beautiful. And there's also some mixed people in this that really don't know how, know what group to truly identify with. And that could be very problematic because I've met a lot of mixed people that know they're viewed as black and they accept black and that's what's up and they accept white and that's fine too. And people ain't know how to, you know, accept both and that's great. But in society, there are still, and I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm just going to be honest. There are also a lot of mixed people that have psychological problems. You know, I, 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 I would do what I can to help those people. But there was a so many aspects and elements that just had to do with real life in this series that Spike Lee adapted. And he just did a real, a really great job. And, um, you know, I really did enjoy the series. If I had to rate uh, she's got to have it. This Netflix original out of a one out of 10, I would give it an 8.5 out of 10. Yes. an 8.5 out of 10. But guys, that is just my opinion. Have you seen she's got to have it? Do you want to see it? Have I turned you on? Have I turned you off? Do you agree with me or you disagree with me? Let me know in the comment section below. Let's get this conversation going and keep it flowing. If you like this video, go ahead and give me the thumbs up. If you didn't provide constructive criticism at the bottom in the comment section, if you watch this on YouTube, subscribe to my channel. Go to my website, check me out there, and also look me up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all that good stuff. It's right there at the bottom of your screen, and I made it very easy by providing a link down in the description box below. But guys, I just want to thank you again for tuning in to my opinion slash review of Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It on Netflix right now. And before you go, don't forget that my name is Brandon Keith Avery, and that's just my opinion. Peace.